Good evening, everybody. Excuse me to take your seats. There's a second. Stop. See a few people at the back, so a chance to get in. So, whilst uh, people are taking their seats, I'd just like to, uh, first of all, thank you all for coming tonight, uh, coming out on a Saturday night and your evening. And uh, also, I'd like to extend uh, thanks to Pete Williams for. Uh, do more than just giving up his evening, but just coming all the way up here from Cambridge to speak to us. Um, just a few uh, notices. Well, first of all, um, if you don't know the title, is Why Would Anyone Believe the Bible Today? Um, it's a joint event run by Starbate Mission and by the Dale Evangelical Church. Um, I'm a member of Starbate Mission, and uh, we're a church in Starbate. It's between Harrogate and Nairsborough. And... Um, I'm just going to ask uh, Matthew to say something in a second about the uh, Evangelical Church, but before I do, I um, just have to cover a few health and safety notices. Um, the fire exits are those with the green running man uh, with the door, so there's some there, some there, and then at the back uh, behind the camera, and uh, straight out the way that you came in. Um, toilets are also straight on if you're desperate, um, then the toilets are straight down the bottom. Um, can I please ask you to check your mobile phones now and um, switch them off, or if you can't bear them to be off, then just put them on silent. And uh, just to give you an idea of just the format of the evening, so um, Peter's going to come and um, speak to us for probably about 45 minutes, and then after that we're going to have uh, a Q&A session, um, so if you've been saving up your questions for Peter to answer, um, then we'll have a roaming mic, and um, you know, in turn, people will have the opportunity to, to answer questions. Um, so I'm just going to ask uh, Matthew just to say something now about St. Lindell Church, and then I think we'll hand over to, to Peter. I'll ask you something about Star Wars first before you disappear. Really? Yeah. Um, what time do you meet? We meet at, uh, we meet at 10 30 on a Saturday morning. No, it's Sunday morning actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like to ask questions. <laughs> And, um, yeah, so we have two Sunday services, so uh, if you're looking for a church, then, um, and you're in the Harrogate Town Centre area, then you can come to start at Mission, uh, 10.30 tomorrow morning, or 6.30 in the evening, and obviously Harrogate is practically a metropolis, because uh, in the day, I think we've got four houses, and uh, so um, because we're from a more rural community, so, uh, um, we meet at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, which is really very, very civilised. And then meet for tea afterwards. Uh, so if you can manage to find us in the Dell, congratulations. We're on the website anyway. But we'd love to see you, and uh, equally you can come and join us at four o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. So uh, that's the two churches. And are we having a speak? We're having a speak now, yeah. Please. Yeah. Great. Well, good evening, and thank you so much for coming out. And thank you also to the organisers who've done a splendid uh, job. I say so far. Uh, but uh, it's really uh, great to be here. I had the privilege of growing up in Ripon. When I was there, I could speak proper, uh, and I can't anymore, uh, so I won't. Uh, but I'm sorry about that. I've been uh, down south for quite a while. And what we're going to be looking at tonight is the subject of whether we can trust or believe the Bible uh, today. But I want to begin with some reasons not to believe the Bible, because I think for some people, they may have a number of reasons in their mind why you might not believe the Bible. I just want to look at some of those briefly. One of those could be that the Bible is almost a very old book, and now is that me doing that? Okay, let's take this further down. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah okay, good. Um, one of it could be that the Bible is a very old book, and when you compare that with the modern things, and you're looking for a guide for life, well, surely we know that we can find a way around with this modern technology, why would we trust a dusty old book? Of course, one might respond that there are other old things, such as water, and we're still very happy drinking that. And anyway, you can get the Bible on a smartphone as well. So, that, in terms of what something being old, that shouldn't come into the question of whether something is something we can trust. Another objection could be that people nowadays see, well, the Bible and Christians as a religion of the book, and they see out in the world, they watch the news, and they say, well, aren't there doing pe people doing lots of bad things in the name of religion? They believe that they should follow their holy book, and it causes them to do all sorts of terrible things, like what happened at 9-11. 
Well, I'd want to comment uh, at that point, and of course say that when people uh, do those uh, terrible things, of course they're doing it because they've got a wrong set of beliefs. But because some people believe that one thing's uh, right and, and it's called a religion, and that causes damage, does that mean that anything that's ever called a religion uh, is uh, bad? And I think we'll see it's rather problematic. If you say religion causes violence, how would you think of this? Politics causes violence, because after all, I mean, when you look out in the world, can you see any major violence going on without politics? What about this? You could say leadership causes violence, because after all, you know, when you look at the terrible things that happen out in the world, isn't it? Because there are leaders. Well, no, you realise that people can lead a good way, and people can lead a bad way. Or if someone would say science causes violence, you would say, well, that's a rather strange thing, but think of all those bombs that are made as a result of science. So we can say science causes violence, but people say, no, 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 because science can bring about medicine. You can, ah, oh, yes, that's right, you can use it for good things, you can use it for bad things, and similarly with our belief systems, they can be for good or for bad. Likewise, someone could say thinking causes violence. If you just stop thinking, there will be no violence. It's actually true. If everyone stopped thinking and there were no thinking at all, we would all be dead and there would be no violence. <laughs> also, we could say this. That if people think that getting rid of Christianity or getting rid of religion is somehow going to stop the violence, let's just remember this, that during the 20th century, the two people who caused the most deaths were Stalin uh, in Russia and Mao in China. Between them, those two atheists killed, and uh, numbers vary, but uh, perhaps 50 million people, uh, maybe quite a bit more, uh, maybe 60, but the, they killed a lot of people. And they were actually people who tried to get rid of the Bible in their own hands. Now, to me, there's a sort of um, credibility that can work in a way like this. When some people are doing some really, really bad thing, which is very destructive, and they actually also want to get rid of the Bible, could that not, in any sense, be used as an argument for the credibility of the Bible? We might have other objections to the Bible. It seems boring. Well, that's not an objection for it, whether it's true or not. All sorts of chemistry textbooks may seem boring. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you whether they're true or not. Or you might say, I don't like what it says, but I often don't like what's on the news. So, you know, does that mean it's not true? Well, sometimes, you know, reporting isn't reliable, uh, but just the fact that I don't like something isn't a reason to reject it. And then something can say it contains lots of mistakes. If that's what you're thinking, I'd want to say, well, what mistakes do you think it think it contains, and why do you believe it contains mistakes? Because it might be that you believe it contains mistakes because you trust someone who told you. And if you're trusting someone who told you, I want to know why are you trusting that person? You see, there is this thing that we all trust something. Everyone already believes. So if our title is, uh, there's one version of it, it's uh, why would anyone trust the Bible today? I think that's what I typed in wrongly. Uh, and it should have been, why did they not believe the Bible today? Well, believe, trust, not much difference for me. Um, but everyone already has a belief system. So uh, you here today, I'd like to say that uh, you have a religion. Everyone has a religion. You may or may not know what it is. Uh, and if I talk to you for a while, I'd probably be able to give you some description. It might not have a name. It might not be a co consistent, internally consistent set of religious thoughts, but nevertheless you have a set of beliefs. What do I mean by that? Some people say, no, I just believe science. I just believe those sorts of things. That can't be true. It simply can't be true, because science can't give you answers to the most important questions in life. So science couldn't tell me, for instance, a fact I know, that my mother loves me. She's sitting over there wearing turquoise, by the way. Um, uh, now, I know that my mother loves me, but there is no scientific experiment whatsoever that can prove it. I might have some evidence that I could adduce in support of the, of the theory that my mother loves me, that I could support it, but you could always explain it, uh, that theory away and say that she's doing it for some other reason, Excuse, excuses for you, using you as an illustrated mum. Um, but the thing is, you cannot prove the most important things in life. You can't prove that anything has any value. There's no scientific experiment you can do which proves that science has a value or that shows how much money you should give to science. So if I say I get all of my values from science, the problem is I won't even do science in the first place because I can't start doing science unless I've already assigned some value to something other than science, you see? 
So in other words, saying I get my beliefs from science just doesn't stack up. You may get some of your beliefs from science, but you're also getting some of your really important beliefs from elsewhere. And that happens when we assign worth to things. Every one of us assigns worth to things. When we put effort into something, when we put time into something, when we put money into something, we're assigning worth. We could say that we're worshipping it, or worshipping it. We're assigning worth something, we're putting a value on something. By the way, this is why you can't have a nation without a, 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 an established religion. Now, let me just, um, I don't want to get too far into this question. <coughs> of course I believe in religious freedom. But don't tell me that you can have a government running an education system with no value system in. You have to have some values. Those values can't just be from scientific experiments. The Nazi uh, scientists were very good at carrying out experiments, and many of them were immoral experiments. So simply the technical know-how you get from science would never tell you that life is worth affirming. It wouldn't tell you what's good and what's bad. In other words, we all have beliefs about what's good or bad that don't come from science, and that we um, assign value to things as we get involved in things. So in other words, you already believe in some things that you can't prove scientifically. And you actually base your life around those things. Because the really important things can't be proven by mathematics. Mathematics can prove abstract things. Formal logic, part of philosophy, can show abstract things. But it doesn't actually work in real life. In real life situations, it's often about trusting people. We all exercise trust, and that's what I want to think about tonight. So everyone's trusting something. Why would anyone trust the Bible? Well, I want to give you some reasons to trust the Bible. Well, I, this talk could be a very, very, very long talk, and you don't want it to be a very, very, very long talk, because I believe that there are so many reasons that you can have for trusting the Bible. Um, and what I hope to do is give you the tip of the tip of the iceberg today. And I just want to give you three headings for that. One is uh, trusting the Bible historically. Uh, secondly, looking at the person of Jesus. And finally, looking at the message. So let's begin with looking at the Bible historically. Um, this is a picture of the library where I work. Uh, it's in the house. There's a Swiss girl just walking down there. We have about 50 people in there every day. Uh, most of them doing advanced degrees on the Bible. And what we try and do in the library in Tindo House uh, it's uh, Britain's uh, finest library of the Bible, and you're welcome to come, is we try to have every book that will give us primary information, primary historical language information, archaeological information about the Bible. That's what we try to do. We don't have all the books that will uh, necessarily warm your heart or make you feel good about the Bible. We try to have the information books. And we have people there scrutinising the text every day. Now, of course, not every scholar in the world believes the Bible. There are many scholars who don't, there are many scholars who do. The point is this. I don't know any scholars in the world who believe Aesop's fables are true. When people look at um, Homer's Iliad, other ancient literature from the past, there's no group of people who can spend their lives studying this and affirm uh, that it's true in any detailed way. And the amount of scrutiny the Bible has, it's been more scrutinized than any other book. And I would just say, when I look at the Bible as against any other uh, literature from the deep past, you find that it stands up to historical scrutiny in many ways. Let me explain that. A lot of people would say that archaeology began in the year 1798, when Napoleon uh, went into Egypt, and when he did so, he decided to take experts in, uh, to Egypt with him. And he had experts going along with his army who were, uh, we might call them early scientists and, and uh, so on, be beginning to take records of what they discovered. And that's when we might say archaeology began. Soon afterwards, uh, people found a Rosetta Stone, uh, which is in the British Museum in London, and a man called uh, Champollion, uh, a French person, although it's sometimes said that an English person helped him crack it, but this uh, uh, French person, uh, uh, Jean Paulion, in 1822, uh, deciphered um, Egyptian. Uh, so you've got some Egyptian here, and here's the Greek which helped him decipher it. 
Uh, about 20 years later, the ancient Babylonian, Akkadian or Assyrian language, and there are three different terms for a very similar group of languages, okay? Akkadian means uh, uh, Assyrian and Babylonian. That language was also deciphered. Shortly after that, Hittite was deciphered. Now, these languages have never been read since the deep past. So, they haven't been read for 1,800 years, maybe 2,000 years, sometimes 3,000 years. No one had read them. The way that uh, the language systems work, the way the writing system work, have been completely forgotten, and people gradually looked at the patterns, gradually observed more and more information, and gradually deciphered them. That's what happened. Now, the, the thing about this is that then gave us access to a whole body of information about uh, antiquity which was not available. There are now about one million ancient Babylonian tablets around, Babylonian and Assyrian. Those uh, two uh, dialects of the same language. That's an awful lot of tablets. Most of them haven't been read. Most, by the way, of the ancient hieroglyphs of Egypt have still not been read. And there's a very obvious reason. The pharaohs had their whole administrative system, uh, it seemed to be, spending most of the day carving hieroglyphs on the temples. No government's going to fund, fund enough people to research and spend their time reading all of those because they don't have the resources that the pharaohs have just to dedicate. Why did the pharaohs do it? Usually the pharaohs were either trying to please the gods or they were trying to boost up their own, boost their own name at the same time. Uh, and uh, So that was really what was going on. But what this means is this. If archaeology began about 200 years ago, if we take a Bible from 300 years ago, and you can easily get lots of plenty of 300-year-old Bibles in Harriet. If you take a Bible from 300 years ago, they cannot have had any of the information you get from archaeology, right? That's the simple point. Now, what you'll find is 300-year-old Bibles, 250-year-old Bibles, here's a Bible from 1789, 85, sorry, often have dates in the margin. Now, these are not dates, of, they're not part of the Bible. But they're scholars, they're things that scholars 300, 350 years ago worked out as the dates for events. And all they had to do is they just had the Bible and they had some of the Greek writings, like Ptolemy, uh, who, who wrote about astronomy and dates for eclipses and things like that. They put this information together and they started putting dates in the Bible. So here we've got the fall of Samaria, uh, and they say that happened in the year 721. Now remember, this is before archaeology begins. We now think based on all that we've learned in the last 200 years, that the year that Samaria fell was 722, not 721. Now, that is not the sort of quality of information that you can get from any ancient writing, Aesop or anything like that. There just isn't that sort of information. But when people looked at the Bible, they found that they were getting such good historical information that they were able to get some really specific details. There were five ancient Assyrian kings mentioned in this order in the Bible. We then decipher the writings of the ancient Assyrians and we find the kings in this order. And that, by the way, when people you know, had their Bibles, those Bibles were often in late copies. Now people say late copies mean unreliable. No, late copies can be very reliable because they've been reliably copied down the ages. And here, people were using late copies that gave them reliable information from 1800 years earlier to their time. You go to the Bible, and you will find a whole number of kings. And many, many of those kings are mentioned outside the Bible in these writings that have been deciphered. So you've got the, the kings from the other nations mentioned in the Bible. You also have the kings in the Bible mentioned in the writings that you decipher from the other nations. So in other words, you have a confirmation going uh, from one to the other. That's the sort of striking thing you get with the Bible. And along with archaeology, then people find older copies of the Bible. This is a 24-foot scroll of the book of Isaiah, which is among the Dead Sea Scrolls, showing that the book of Isaiah, from the first part of the Bible, the, the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, the, the part written before uh, Jesus, um, that actually really was before Jesus. Uh, here on the right, we've got a tablet that's only... Uh, come out in the last 20 years, which mentions King David. And again, it's an uh, archaeological monument. So that's one reason you could trust the Old Testament historically, and we'll come on to the New Testament in a minute. Another reason to trust the Bible historically would be the nature of the narrative when you read it. Here's an ancient Phoenician inscription. Let me read it to you. 
I am Kinemur, the king of something. I mean, um, we can't read that word. Um, sorry, um, the son of, of king, and then we can't read the name. King Gabba reigned over Yadia. It really is called Yadia, but achieved nothing. Then came Barma, and he achieved nothing. My own father, Haya, did nothing with his reign. My brother Shalyam also did nothing. It was I, Kilamua, who managed to do what none of my ancestors had done. Now, you might notice a little bit of what we might call bias in this writing. Just a little bit of bias. This is Kilamua, and he's putting it up in order to glorify Kilamua. This is actually what a lot of ancient Egyptian inscriptions look like as well. They tell you that Ramses is really great. Or they tell you that Amenhotep's really great. The ones by Ramses don't tell you Amenhotep's really great. One by Amenhotep don't tell you that Ramses is really great. They tell you that they themselves are really great. That's the way those writings work, as a rule. Look at this and compare it with a sort of text you could find many of in the Old Testament. This is what it says. Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria in the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father, in the way of his mother, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Now, one thing for certain, it was not commissioned that writing was not commissioned by Ahaziah, right? Do we agree on that? You know, this is not royal propaganda. The Book of Kings in the Old Testament, which tells you all about the kings, was not sponsored financially by the kings. It just wasn't. You can tell there is no national literature which says as much negative about the people group from which it originates as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. There is no national literature that does that. You come on to the New Testament, the writings about the early Christians, and what do they tell you? They tell you similar things. They tell you that all of the um, believers, uh, all of the disciples with Jesus ran away. Well, look, if I were a disciple editing the Gospels, I would have just left that bit out. It doesn't look very cool. So when you look at the Gospels, clearly they're not propaganda to tell you that the early Christians were good. So we have a striking message going through the Bible, which I think uh, many of us will find trustworthy. But is it just Christian accounts that can tell us about the Bible? No, in fact, non-Christian accounts can tell us about some key things. And I want to look at one of the non-Christian accounts, which tells us something about early Christianity. And this is uh, in a Roman historian called Tacitus. Now, Tacitus was, uh, lived in Rome, and he was born around the year 56. And he writes about the Great Fire in the year in, in Rome in the year 64. So he's around age 8, he's not very old at the time. But Tacitus is actually a pretty reliable reporter. He's the first person to tell the world, for instance, that there were locks in Scotland uh, and so on. He, he was able to get information from way, way um, away from him. And yet he was someone living in Rome. Now, he's actually reporting about what happened in Rome at this time. When there is a Great Fire, and people think Nero has started it. Nero becomes less popular and then does a little bit to try and make himself more popular. So this is where we break into the narrative. But neither help by humans nor generous gifts from the emperor, that's Nero, could, or not all the way to placating heaven, could stifle the scandal or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by order. That's order of Nero. Therefore, to scotch the rumour, Nero substituted as comforts and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men, loathed for their vices, whom the crowd called Christians. Now, notice he mentions this group called Christians. Notice that the crowd calls them Christians, not the Christians call them Christians. That's an interesting point. The word Methodist was first applied by non-Methodists <laughs> to Methodists, okay? It was like an insult. Afterwards, the Methodists then called themselves Methodists. The word Quaker was first used by non-Quakers as an insult of the Quakers. Only later do the Quakers call themselves Quakers. It's what people call outsider language and insider language, you see? At first, the word Christian was outsider language. Christians didn't call themselves Christians. And it's really striking. When I read the New Testament, there are three occurrences of the word Christian, and all of them are applied as outsider language, non-Christians using the term. If, by the way, the New Testament were written later on, I think it would much more use the term as insider language, but it doesn't. But notice there's this group called Christians. Now, from the word Christian, we can infer quite a bit. Because the word Christian comes from the word Christus in Latin, Christos in, in Greek, which is the word for anointed, meaning 
that this group believes that the Jewish anointed one or Messiah has come. So just from that name on its own, we can infer there's a group of people in the year 64 in Rome who believe that the Jewish Messiah has come. And this is what it says about them. Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius, who was emperor, by the way, from the year 14 through to the year 37, by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate, who was governor, we know from Josephus, from the year 26 through to the year 36. We're going to need those dates later. And the malicious superstition was checked for a moment, only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital, that's Rome itself, where all things horrible or shameful in the world connect and become fashionable. Well, he could have written to the Guardian, for me. Um, <laughs> but what you see is uh, it, it confirms the existence of Christ, and it confirms a precise time that he dies, sometime between the year 26 and the year 36, and it confirms that uh, the belief in him originated in Judea. And that's going to be important because that's, of course, what the Bible says, uh, with things beginning in Jerusalem, the capital of Judea. He then goes on. First then, confessed members of the sect were arrested. Next on their disclosures, vast numbers were convicted, not so much on the count of arson, as for hatred of the human race. And their region accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs. Or they were fastened on crosses and when daylight failed, were, uh, were burned to serve as lamps. By night. In other words, in this early point in Christianity, and uh, Christ is said to have died sometime between the year 26 and the year 36, so within 40 years, perhaps within 30 years of the beginnings of Christianity, there are large numbers of people who believe that he's the Messiah and are in Rome and are willing to pay a very high price for their belief that this is true. Now, martyrdom does not prove that a, a cause is true. It simply doesn't. What it does do is it shows that the person who gets martyred for a cause sincerely believes in something. They can be sincerely deluded, but I think it does at least show the sincerity of these early Christians, the price that's being paid. In terms of how far Christianity is spread, it's spread from Jerusalem to Rome, which is about the same distance, by the way, <clears throat> as if you go from Rome to the top of the Shetland Islands. Well, uh, who's been to the Shetland Islands here? A long way, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, just to give you some sense of the distance involved. So Christianity spread far and fast. Now, that, I would simply say, shows us some constraints that we need to have in the way that we explain how Christianity arose. Some people like to have the idea that Christianity just arose and people told stories from mouth to mouth to mouth and eventually these stories really got exaggerated. I just want to say that the message really needs to be there up front because if you don't have a message agreed up front, why is it going to spread? Secondly, if people were changing the story all the time when they told it, then what you'd end up with is real chaos after a certain number of years and it would be a sort of chaos, a chaotic belief you wouldn't be able to change. Because in those days, there was no easy communication, no easy travel. Um, so it would be very hard for the Christian leaders to say, well, you know you've been hearing the story is like this, actually it was like that. It would be very hard for that to happen. So in other words, for Christianity to arise with the beliefs it had, I don't think you can say that let's say the belief that Jesus rose from the dead arose 30 years after it began when Christianity has spread all this distance. You really have to say that a basic belief like that has to be there up front. Now, secondly, I want to come on to another set of reasons for trusting the Bible, and that is uh, someone who's very central to the Bible, namely uh, Jesus Christ. And the striking thing about Jesus, for me, is the number of coincidences that seem to cluster on him. Now, you sometimes get some very multi-talented people. There was the Polish Prime Minister, um, Paderewski, who was also a brilliant pianist, as well as a great politician. There was uh, the uh, Dutch Prime Minister, Abraham Kuyper, who was a great philosopher and uh, was also a great politician. I think Sebastian Coe has managed to be a great runner and also has managed to uh, you know, dabble in politics. I've got a friend who was US number one in the pilot, number two in the world, she had an investment career, she plays the trumpet release uh, well, and she's now doing a PhD on the Bible. So, obviously, she's a very talented person. 
But what you don't get is people who have had 10 different successful careers, who just everything they turn their hand to uh, seems to uh, go well, or have so many different coincidences happen in their life. Coincidences run out after a while. Uh, and what we find with Jesus is that actually we have lots of coincidences about it. Now, one of the things that some skeptics don't like about Christianity is that Christians believe in miracles. And miracles are said to spoil science. Science has laws, and if you have miracles, it spoils the pattern. So you've got some mint patterns where you've got scientific laws, and miracles spoil the pattern. And I would say, no, Christians don't believe in uh, pattern spoiling miracles. We believe in pattern making miracles. That actually, the organising principle for the, all of the miracles we believe in is one person. And we actually believe that he is the organising principle for all of the knowledge in the universe. So, in other words, we're not saying, um, you know, look at our non pattern and believe in that uh, rather than your pattern. I'd say, no, we actually believe that there is a pattern, it's Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain a little bit more. One little coincidence we might begin with about Jesus is that he's a Jew. Now, that might not strike you as very much, but it's, it's strange, isn't it, that Jews make up about 0.2% of the world's population, one in 500 people or so, and yet they manage to get 41% of the Nobel Prizes in economics. 28% in medicine, 26% in physics. Something strange going on here, isn't there? I mean, just the purport, the influence that Jews have in the world today is quite disproportionate to their population. Remarkable people group. And it just so happens that Jesus came from this. So maybe it's not a coincidence. <coughs> Another coincidence is that there seems to be a very early belief that he was born in a royal city, namely Bethlehem. Now you might want to say that was uh, a belief that um, arose after his birth, uh, that he was actually born somewhere else and they just um, made it up to make it sound better, you know, having born in a royal city. I have a problem with that. It's, it's the real problem of Christianity spreading far and fast. If the idea that he's born in Bethlehem wasn't there up front, I need to know when and where it arose, because I think it's very difficult to get beliefs like this <coughs> believed by all the Christians, uh, unless it was uh, believed about him from the beginning. Some of his family members, uh, including a half-brother of his, were prepared to die for their Christian belief. And yet it just so happens that there is uh, a text written before Jesus was born in the uh, Jewish scriptures that says this, You Bethlehem of Rapha, are too little to be among the clouds of Judah, from you shall come for me, one will be ruler over Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. So that's a weird way of writing, isn't it? Talking about someone who's been, somehow had origins from very, very long ago, and yet is in the future, at the time of the writing. Now, that's just a really nice coincidence, if you're going to be great, if you to have a text like that, written about the very town uh, that you come from. Well, there's a little coincidence, even in his name. He had uh, four brothers, according to the Gospels, and uh, 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 we actually read about them from some other sources as well. And yet he's got the only name, which is to do with saving. The others have got four ordinary names. It's widely agreed that he was famous prior to his death. You can find this in Jewish sources, not just Christian sources. You can find it in some of the uh, sources of those who debated the early Christians, like uh, Kelsus and other skeptics. He was early believed on uh, to have performed miracles. There are more miracles attributed to him in a short time, uh, with writings close to his time, than of anyone else from the past. There are rabbis uh, who are sending the copies to his writings to have performed miracles, but none of them before more than a few. And no one seems to have debated that Jesus performed miracles. When Christians got into debate with non-Christians early on, um, uh, skeptics tend to say that they used dark magic to perform the miracles, and Jews likewise uh, claim that Jesus was using bad magic uh, for the miracles. But there's no belief that he performed miracles. Now we're just beginning some coincidence about Jesus. Another coincidence we could say is, it seems to me that he had some really amazing teaching. Now I don't read Chinese, but this looks really nice. Confucius, who lived uh, uh, before uh, Jesus, came up with a very good uh, teaching, and it went like this. What you do not want, do not force onto others. Or, in one translation, what you do not want to do yourself, do not force unto others. That's in Confucius' Analects. 
there was a rabbi shortly before the time of Jesus who came up with uh, this uh, teaching, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. That's the whole law. But Jesus is the only one who has this ascribed to him. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So whereas Rabbi Hillel has the negative form of what we call the golden rule, which many people seem to live by, Jesus is the only one who has the positive form. Now you might say, how do we know Jesus said it? Well, either Jesus said it, or he was very lucky. Because he was very lucky to have disciples who came up with brilliant ideas and attributed them to him. I mean, wouldn't we all like to have people around us who came up with brilliant ideas and then said that we came up with them? So either way, there's a coincidence relating to Jesus. Similarly, we can say, when we read in the uh, New Testament, there are lots of stories told by Jesus. Now you might say, well, Jesus didn't tell those stories. Even more amazing, that some people came up with some amazing stories like the story of the prodigal son or the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, stories that have inspired people through the centuries, and then attributed them to him. That was really lucky. So in other words, I'm saying that there are lots of coincidences um, that cluster around Jesus. However skeptically you want to treat the material, uh, there's a lot going on there. Now, another coincidence that happens with Jesus is a new type of literature arises. When people wrote biographies back then, they wrote biographies about two sorts of people only. People from high social classes, like when Suetonius writes about the lives of the emperors, high social class, or they write about people from long, long ago, right? Either high social class or long, long ago. What they do not do is write books about people from lower social classes near their time. And yet Jesus has four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, written about his life very close to the time uh, that he is said to have uh, lived here on earth. That's a rather striking thing. So it's another coincidence, we might say, that clusters onto Jesus. Now it's widely agreed that Jesus died at a particular time. He, it's said, not just in the New Testament, but also in the Jewish Talmud, that he was executed on the eve of the Passover. Now the Passover was when the Jews celebrated their greatest deliverance in the whole of their history. It was when the Jews are said to have come out of Egypt and been delivered by God from uh, a terrible time in Egypt and delivered from Pharaoh. And they celebrate that with their biggest feast. And yet it seems that that was exactly the point when Jesus died. Now that's very interesting because the Christian idea uh, uh, attested through the New Testament writings is that Jesus was actually acting like that Passover lamb mentioned in the Passover. He was actually acting as a sacrifice when he died on the cross. Well, if you're going to have a message developed about you being a sacrifice, how jolly convenient if you die on the one day of the year when it would be best for you to sort of symbolise sacrifice. So that's another coincidence we could say relating to Jesus. We can add more coincidences of a type I could go on for a long time, but won't, uh, on the subject of parts of the Old Testament that seem to talk about things that Jesus did. Um, here is just a coincidence, uh, we could say, where there's a part of the Old Testament, one of the Psalms, that seems to describe someone rather in a, a position like being crucified. It talks about how all his bones are out of joint, um, his strength is dried up like a pop shirt, his, his um, uh, tongue sticks to his jaws, he lay me in the dust of death. Uh, dogs encompass me, a uh, company of evil doers encircles me, they pierce my hands and my feet. Um, I can count on my bones, they stare and gloat over me, they divide my garments among them for my clothing, they cast lots. Now there does seem to be some correlation between what happens to Jesus on the cross and a text like this. You can explain away one phrase, you can explain away two phrases. Maybe you can explain away the whole thing. But then there are other texts that seem to point to Jesus as well. I'm not saying that any of these coincidences can't be explained away. I think you can explain away every single coincidence. I think you can. But the problem is you just have to come up with a new explanation each time. It's not that you're using any systematic um, uh, explanation. Now, another striking thing is, and this has only been known since 1983, is that the most likely method of the crucifixion of Jesus, that's April the 3rd, AD 33, 
was actually the date of a lunar eclipse, an eclipse of the moon. How do we get to that? Well, Jesus was crucified on a Friday, that's why we have Good Friday. And when we look at when uh, Passover happens, uh, during the time when uh, Pontius Pilate was governor, there are only two times that we have uh, Friday available. One is the year 30, one is the year 33. When we look at the indications in the New Testament of when Jesus is said to have begun, and remember that the New Testament writers weren't interested in talking about AD dates, and they never talk about uh, lunar eclipses. Uh, they say that uh, Jesus began his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius, which most people work out as the year 29. Um, Tiberius Emperor did have a bit of a co-regency for two years earlier, and some people counted from there. But most people counted as 29. And John's Gospel tells you that he went through at least three Passover cycles. So that means he's past the year 30, and therefore the most likely date is the year 33. Now, the, the coincidence uh, here is that that evening, after Passover, or when people were just having the Passover meal, there was a, a lunar eclipse. Now, I'm, you know what a lunar eclipse is, but in case there's someone here who's forgotten, let me explain so, a solar eclipse is simple. We have Earth here, and we have the Sun there, and the Moon gets in between us and the Sun, so we don't see the Sun. And just by some coincidence, uh, the Moon is 400 times smaller than the Sun, and also 400 times nearer. So they look at exactly the same size. But that, I'm sure, is just coincidence, isn't it? I mean, you know. Uh, but, for, I mean, some people can explain, you, you can explain why these things coincidences, uh, and, and that's, that's fine. Um, that's the solar eclipse. On the other side, we have um, a, a lunar eclipse. And, and what happens there is you have the moon there, and you have the sun there, and the earth comes between the sun and the moon. And that means that we're sort of blocking out the light from the sun. And as the light goes around the earth, um, because of uh, the way light moves, it becomes red and it turns all nice blood red. And uh, it can be calculated to win an error of 20 minutes that between 6.20 and 7.11 p.m. that evening from Jerusalem, uh, you could uh, see a solar eclipse. And that means that crowds waiting to celebrate the Passover would have seen a pretty amazing sight. Um, there's just a little coincidence here. And that is that there is a passage about saying what's going to happen at the really great time when God does his action. It says the sun should be turned to darkness. And there's a claim in the Gospels that happened. Uh, and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Uh, and it connects that, by the way, with Jerusalem and Zion. <laughs> now, there are some other coincidences. Um, after Jesus' death, uh, he is said to have risen from the dead. Now, is that just a story that people made up because they couldn't bear the fact that they were missing him and in bereavement they projected his future existence? Well, there is a further thing that his body is missing. Now, I can explain the body missing easily. All you need to do is get some people to remove it, like some grave robbers. That's fine. Um, uh, by the way, why would you steal a body? Um, maybe disciples took it away uh, and, and because they wanted to protect the heat from the dead. That's fine, but then you have another coincidence which doesn't get explained that way, way so well. And that is that lots and lots of different people claim to have seen him risen from the dead. Now, this is not the sort of sighting that you get sometimes where people see a statue and they think it's moving slightly and, or anything like that. The sightings that are claimed to happen within the New Testament books of Jesus are in the morning, in the evening, in the town, in the country, on a hill, by a lake, standing, sitting, walking, indoors, outdoors, by prior appointment, or without prior appointment, in groups of one, two, um, five, up to 500. You have a huge variety of different appearances, and Jesus is always talking in these uh, appearances. Now, I can get rid of Jesus' body if I just get some people to steal it. That won't explain why a whole diverse group of people claim to have seen Jesus on many different occasions. I can make them all liars, but then I have to explain why. What are, what are they doing that for? Why are some of these people suffering so much for it? It doesn't really make much sense. So that seems to me a very convenient thing. Now, it's not just that you have the missing body and you have many people claiming to have seen him risen from the dead. I mean, that could have happened, let's say that happened about someone completely random. That would be an interesting thing to investigate. But if it happens to someone who people already may be the uh, Jewish Messiah, is already believed to have performed miracles, comes from the town where people 
uh, believed that the great Jewish rescuer would come from, and we start loading all of those coincidences together, it starts becoming more, um, more harder to explain away. Then there is this belief that develops very early on that he himself is God. Now, this is not something uh, you can uh, trust Dan Brown for. There's not much you can trust Dan Brown for to be entertained. But um, uh, Dan Brown has this idea that after 300 years, people decided, oh, let's um, give Jesus a bit of an upgrade and let's call him God. In fact, what we find is the very earliest documents of Christianity, including letters that are written not to prove anything at all, seem to assume that we should be worshipping Jesus, praying to him, viewing him as the creator, viewing him as the judge of all time. These are things that, for a Jew, only God does. Now, some people just have this idea that the idea that Jesus is God evolved over time. You know, at first, Jesus was a very special human, then he was a very, very special human, then a very, very, very special human, then halfway to God, and eventually, after enough time and enough exaggeration, all the way to God. The problem with that is mathematical. And, and how many gods do Greeks have? Millions. Well, maybe that's a bit too much. But yeah, lots. Okay, many. That's the right answer, many. Um, how many do Romans have? Many. How many gods do Jews have? One. Okay, good. Now, the problem is this. Christianity begins in the cradle of Judaism. Jews only have one god, which means you cannot do a Percy Jackson. I know first Jackson, maybe don't. But you know, what happens with the Greek gods? Zeus looks down from the sky, sees a pretty gal, gets together with her, and they produce, and that gives you another half god. You see? That's what happens, and the number of gods can keep going up. So you should say, how many gods do the Greeks have? Many and counting. Okay? But what we can say is that for a Jew, you can't have a half god. Because God isn't like a sort of substance you can chop in half. You know, it doesn't work like that. You can't have a half god, you can't have a quarter god. Which means there is no evolutionary path to get from being non-god to being god. Because you have the god is supposed to be the creator of all things. And there's a big dichotomy between the creator and the created. You see, you've got one side and the other side, and you, you can't just cross it gradually. It just doesn't work. So how does a group of Jews, and, and actually most of the earliest Christians were Jews, come to be convinced that uh, Jesus is God. Uh, well, it'd be pretty hard. There are further things I can talk about in terms of coincidences. There are texts which, within the Jewish scriptures which really do fit very well with Jesus. I mean, this is one that gets read regularly at regular Christmas. Uh, for, it goes, for unto us, uh, actually, it's um, Handel put it to music, didn't it? For unto us uh, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, maybe but some of you can hear the tune, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, uh, 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 Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The key thing is there that he's called Mighty God. Now, imagine you go to Riyadh or Mecca, and you call out, God has just been born as a child. How well will you get on? Probably not very well, because people in those countries believe there's only one God, right? And believe that it's not possible for that God to be born as a child, right? Now, just as much as people in Mecca believe there's one God, that much the Jews at the time of the New Testament believed there was only one God. So, to have a bit like this in the Jewish scriptures, talking about someone called mighty God getting born, is just weird, and yet it fits very well with um, uh, Christian belief. You also have, uh, with an another Old Testament text, I, I don't have the time to read it, where it talks about this figure using five different expressions for him dying and suffering on behalf of people, clearly dying, being buried, and then it talks about him uh, having a future victorious existence. You have so many different things. Now, so what I want to say about this is when I look at Jesus, I see someone who organises things around himself. That is, he, he makes sense of things. He forms a pattern. The, the, the patterns form around him. He's got too many coincidences about him. And I can explain every single one of them away. And of course, there are clever people in the world who can explain everything. You know, that's fine. But the fact that you can explain something away doesn't mean it was right to explain it away. There are ways of accounting for these things because at the end of the day, God isn't into forcing people uh, to believe if they don't want to. You know, no one can force you to believe the truth. But what I would say is 
there are some really amazing things, and I just um, scratched the surface with the birth of Jesus uh, that really cluster on him. And then more briefly, I want just to talk about the message, uh, and I think this is a message that really fits with exactly what humans need to hear. You know, beneath the surface there is a problem. We saw that in 2011, didn't we, with the uh, London riots, that uh, just everything seemed to be really fine one day, and the next day we realised that there was a, a deep problem underneath. And I think that's actually how our lives are. Our lives, most of the time, they seem fine, but every now and then come real crunch moments when even those who uh, might see themselves as being really pretty decent citizens do some people some pretty bad terms. Uh, uh, and, and sometimes you see these things in some of the long-term family relationships and the uh, tensions which can arise in those where we see who we really are because we can't hide uh, from our families. And we realise that in us uh, there is a real uh, problem. And there are lots of things that aren't the solution. Politics isn't the solution. Whatever way the referendum goes uh, on uh, Scottish uh, devolution uh, in a couple of weeks' time won't actually make a complete difference to the nature of people north and south of the border. There will be people who I think will be morally weak, struggling because of a principle inside them which seems to get them to do wrong things. That will happen whatever way things go. Education isn't the answer. You can be very highly educated and use that education for wrong purposes. Again, science isn't, isn't the answer. People can use science, again, for many wrong things. And <clears throat> perhaps the way Disney puts it, Disney likes to say, above all, be true to yourself. As if we all have this light inside us, so we just need to follow that. And if, provided we're true to those principles inside us, not too much harm is going to come on. I'm sorry, but saying be true to yourself to Adolf Hitler would not have been a helpful thing. Probably there was nothing that would have been helpful, but, but actually being true to yourself can be a horrible thing. And I think being true to myself, if that means the selfish self, which so easily could be, and I believe would be uh, uh, the main principle in my life if God hadn't changed my life, I don't think that's helpful at all. And there are some testimonies outside on how we need something more. This is Matthew Paris writing in the Times a few years ago, uh, where he wrote uh, a provocative article um, where he said, as an atheist, I truly believe Africa needs God. So he's an atheist, and this is what he says. Now a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa, sharply distinct from the work of secular NGOs, government projects, and international um, aid efforts. These alone will not do. Education and training alone will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real. The change is good. I believe that we really need something from the outside uh, which is going to transform us. And that is not something that we can look to humans uh, to life for. So this question, why do we need the Bible? Some people are trying to see how they can run modern society entirely guided by human wisdom, the wisdom that we share amongst ourselves. And I think that may seem fine for a while, but it will get us into some very deep trouble. I want to um, share with you a, a few things that I think uh, about the transforming nature of the, uh, of the Christian belief. Um, let's talk, uh, firstly, let's look on the left, the Lord of Bella Vista. Bella Vista was a very violent prison in Medellin, in Colombia. Uh, according to one statistic, there were an average of 20 murders per day at one point in the prison. So this is just that, it's one of the most violent prisons you can possibly imagine. Uh, the prison guards could not keep it under control. They were about to call in the army. But then uh, the a prison chaplain who was a volunteer and a former convict who had come uh, to uh, become a Christian, um, he asked whether he could pray and actually what happened in Bellavista was a remarkable transformation with many, many people become Christians, many convicts changed lives and as a result uh, they were transformed into people who did not want to hurt uh, each other. This man in the middle was someone I know personally, uh, a friend Tom Tarrant, he was in the Ku Klux Klan and uh, he bombed 30 uh, synagogues and uh, he was uh, then uh, caught in an FBI shootout. Uh, his female accomplice got uh, killed at that point and uh, he was shot 30 times and put in prison. 
uh, recovered in prison uh, and uh, then escaped again. Uh, he was involved in another shootout. Again, his accomplice was shot, and not he, and he uh, got to prison. And um, in prison, he became a Christian, and that transformed his life. He now heads up something called the uh, C.S. Lewis Institute in Washington, D.C. Now he's uh, served his time, and is a remarkable person for uh, turning around from that hate that he uh, once preached and lived by uh, to uh, serve uh, and uh, seek to live for Jesus Christ. Now on the right we have, uh, just as an illustration, the book by Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion. I have heard many stories of people becoming Christians and turning their life turning around very radically. There are stories about lots of people, lots of prisoners, really having a major transformation in their lives. What I have not heard is this. People in prisons reading atheist literature and their life turning around and them wanting to give up their crime. So in other words, there's a transforming power going on here uh, with the Christian message. So is the solution then that we should all sort of get religious and get Christian? Not at all. Because actually, the point about this is that the message that the Bible has is that humans are not only weak, they are actually rebellious against God. They're turning away from God, and they're powerless to do anything about that. And that's why they need rescue from outside. So just as our problem, if we have no Bible, is that we're just there thinking how to work things out on our own. We actually may need to be told the answer from the outside. That's why God speaks to us. But there's a further problem, and that is, even if we knew what the right thing to do is, we wouldn't do it. And that's where we don't just need a helping hand. Actually, Jesus, who according to the Bible is God himself, comes into the world and he does something very radical. And that is, given that we have rebelled against God and according to the principles of justice laid out in the Bible, we therefore deserve to be punished for that. He goes to the cross and he willingly gives up his life in order to take the punishment that we deserve if we trust in him. Uh, the punishment that we deserve for everything wrong that we've done. And when you see the cross, and this is an ancient graffiti depicting the cross, and I'll show you a bit more clearly. This is the way one early Roman thought of the cross. Um, here we have a donkey, uh, a donkey's head on someone uh, on a cross. And underneath, a man with his hand raised in prayer, and there we have, in this very speck graffiti, you can find this in Rome, actually, from the 2nd century, Alexandrus worshipped God. For a Roman, looking at Jesus being crucified on the cross, it was generally ridiculous to think of him as God. Because being crucified was being publicly portrayed as a loser. That's the way the Romans showed that they were in charge, and whoever is on the cross is a loser. And yet the early Christian message was this, that on the cross... That is where God most clearly reveals himself to us. Most clearly speaks to us. And many people at this time came to believe, and many Jews, for whom even believing that God had become a man was hard enough, to believe that he had actually gone onto the cross and died uh, in such a shameful way, taking the punishment for sin, that would have been really hard to swallow. And yet the evidence was so overwhelming that many, many Jews early on came to acknowledge that he was the Lord of the whole universe. And so the Christian message is this, that we can't get to understand the world on our own. We can't get to live in the world aright on our own. We actually need to turn around and we need to invite God himself to change us just as he sent his son to die on the cross, taking away that sin which is like a barrier between us and God, the message is this, that that barrier can be taken away because Christ on the cross died paying for the punishment of everyone who would trust in him. In other words, it's not about us trying to better ourselves. It's not about us reaching up to God. It is about him reaching down. Now you might say, well, that's nice, that's a beautiful message. I would say it's not just a beautiful message, it's actually a necessary message, because anything else is not going to solve all the problems in the world. Now, I haven't been asked to tell you all about the Christian message. The Christian message will be clearly uh, uh, talked about 
in any of the churches that are represented here. Uh, and so if uh, that's uh, new to you or old to you, uh, I would encourage you to hear more about that. But I do want to just leave uh, you, you with this, and then you can probe me as much as you like in questions. Um, I think we have so many different converging lines of evidence for trusting the Bible. Uh, we have the historical evidence and how it is uh, really unique as a book. I think we have the evidence of so many different coincidences related to Jesus Christ. And I think we also have the evidence of the message contained within the Bible, which is exactly what humans need. Thank you very much for listening, and time now to you for questions. There's a roving mic. And um, don't be shy. <laughs>